Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to the Islam Channel podcast. This is our second episode and wherever you're listening to this from, please make sure you hit those follow buttons and those subscribe buttons. We're now available on Acast and all the other podcast uh, platforms, whether that's Spotify, whether that's Apple, whether that's Google, whatever you listen to podcasts on, you should be able to find us there. And if you're listening or watching this on YouTube, then go down into that description box and click on the, uh, the follow button to find find the podcast uh, in terms of the audio. So uh, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce my co-host. So today I have with me Jamil Hussein, who is our news editor at Islam Channel. Assalamu alaikum, Jamil. Well, How are you doing? Alaikum assalam. I'm great. I'm, I'm, you know, happy to be a sidekick. Uh, <laughs> you're not a sidekick. You're a co-host. <laughs> We're going to do this together. We've brought you on today uh, because you've written an article very recently on our website, which is islamchannel.tv, uh, about the 20th anniversary of Guantanamo Bay. So can you tell us um, what Guantanamo Bay is? Give us a bit of background into this 20th anniversary before we get started with our special guest. Sure. Um, so you're probably a bit too young, uh, Shwen, to remember. <laughs> but I remember it very clearly as I was going to kind of university at the time. And I remember the backlash that kind of ensued from this. So it was on kind of January 11th, 2002, the first detainees of the so-called War on Terror uh, arrived at Camp X-Ray in Guantanamo Bay. So it's 20 years since the first man set foot in that detention camp in Cuba, hooded, shackled, restrained in that infamous orange jumpsuit. Why? Well, basically, the administration of President Bush wanted this facility in their fight against what they called, like I said, the war on terror. Ultimately, it allowed the US government to hold detainees indefinitely outside of normal laws or any kind of judicial oversight. So, you know, things like the Geneva Convention, the US Constitution did not apply. It was a foreign soil where human rights groups say people could be endlessly denied, detained without charge, interrogated without protection and, of course, tortured. Um, you know, four presidents and billions of dollars later, Gitmo, as it's also known as, is still open today. And around 800 people have gone through uh, that camp. And one of those was our guest today. Yes, one of those was uh, Mazen Beg. So today we have Mazen Beg joining us uh, for this special podcast where we're discussing the 20th anniversary. Assalamu alaikum, Mazen. Welcome to the Islam Channel podcast. Thank you for joining us. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My pleasure and honor to be speaking to you, brothers. I hope that it's a beneficial um, gathering, inshallah. Inshallah, I mean, I mean. Uh, so uh, Jamil was just saying that Guantanamo Bay still open at the moment uh, and at currently what it seems to stand at is there's about 39 people in the camp 27 of them have never been charged with anything and so my first question to you is 20 years later how is this still going on there was a lot of talk a few years ago from Obama that's going to be closed down many people still think right now that it was shut down by Obama uh, Biden's made another promise as well so how is it still going on 20 years later uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, first of all, uh, you know, the thing people need to remember about Guantanamo is that it's like a bipartisan project. It's Democrat, it's Republican, it's both sides of the political divide. Both have um, had an interest in keeping it open, uh, although Obama said that he'd close it. Uh, we've got to remember that uh, uh, Biden was his vice president at the time when he said that. So that kind of uh, obligation to close it is still upon him being part of that uh, uh, Democratic Party. Uh, but the reason why it's not been closed is because uh, Guantanamo has been described as a place where the worst of the worst were held. And that's what the drip feed of the uh, information given to the United States has been, that these guys are the most dangerous uh, on the planet. And yet, the truth be told, uh, over 700 and uh, around 40 have been released. Now, and that asks, bears, you know, begs a question as to if they were so dangerous, why were we uh, released? But the real reason why it's still open is because those prisoners uh, who are held there are held without charge and trial. If they were taken onto the U.S. soil, uh, the first thing that would happen is that they, they immediately they would have to be taken to the court or they'd have to be released. Uh, there's no third option. Holding people without charge or trial is essentially kidnap and false imprisonment. And, and the other part of it is that 
those few who have been charged with crimes, which include the involvement of preparing for attacks on September the 11th, uh, cannot be prosecuted in a U.S. mainland court because they were all tortured, waterboarded, mm -hmm. uh, using medieval techniques of torture against them. And evidence extracted from that is inadmissible in any court. So they've now dug themselves into a ditch in which they keep pe holding people without charge or trial in Guantanamo, can't take them, can't prosecute them meaningfully because they tortured them. And uh, this is the lesson that the United States now is stuck with. And as a result, uh, Guantanamo is still here. Mm. Uh, I mean, I guess 20 years on, I mean, you've kind of touched on it there, but what do you think Guantanamo represents to the world and in particular to the Muslim world? I mean, I think one of the reasons why Guantanamo was set up was to, uh, to frighten the Muslim world, to terrify people. Remember, there are prisoners from around 45 odd countries, almost every Muslim country you can think of, and then some more from Europe and elsewhere. Um, and it was to send a clear message, a message that this is what we do, this is what we can do, this is what we will do. Forget about us talking about the laws and regulations. Nothing applies. As you said, Geneva Conventions don't apply. U.S. military law does not apply. The U.S. Civilia, uh, civil code does not apply. There's only a, a new rule in Guantanamo, and that's for you guys. And anybody that messes with America will end up here in the in the, in kind of I said the best worst option. And that's this is all all happening at a time when. The invasion of Afghanistan is taking place. The invasion of Iraq is taking place. So whilst this prison exists, uh, Muslim, the Muslim world is being devastated by uh, America's most powerful uh, conventional weapons, which are the next thing before the use of nuclear weapons. So they're dropping 22,000 pound bombs in Afghanistan. Um, and the only thing after that is nuclear weapons. So this is kind of the this is what's done to the Muslim world. It, the, the war on terror in Guantanamo is just one part of it. People had to go through secret detentions, torture, um, uh, physical, sexual, racial abuse before they even got to Guantanamo. Um, so, so, so that's what it's done to the Muslim world. It's become a symbol of uh, injustice uh, and Islamophobia in the war on terror. Well. If it was set up to strike fear into people, like you said, to, to, to terrify people, uh, how does somebody like you, a British man in the UK, end up going to Guantanamo Bay then? What, what is the linkage between that if it's meant to be for supposedly the bad guys, supposedly the people who are committing uh, acts of terror, then how do you end up there? Well, here's the question. What is a bad guy? How do you define a bad guy? The majority, as I said, uh, and, and it's a good question, uh, 730 odd prisoners have been released uh, and they include senior members of the Taliban who are now uh, 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 actually ministers in the government. They are the ones who negotiated with the United States the withdrawal of the United States forces. So you've got to really ask yourself important questions. Exactly what, what, how do you determine a bad guy? Yesterday's bad guy is today's friend. Yesterday's friend is today's bad guy. Uh, who actually did something to the United States of America? The United States of America has done, in terms of doing, far more than and that was done to it. 9-11 was a terrible day for, for America, of course, there's no doubt about that. But the Amer America has uh, done the equivalent of 500 9-11s in the Muslim world. And uh, we, as the former prisoners, the majority of us, had nothing to do with harming America in any way. But America had everything to do with harming us. I'm one of the ones who got off lightly for three years in Guantanamo. Some of my friends um, that I know were held there for 15 years without trial. And I'm not talking about people, friends from different parts of the world, but people in London who live in London, um, people who are still held in Guantanamo almost 20 years later, the majority of whom have not been charged with a crime. So this, what this tells you is although America tried to frighten the world, it did something else. It scored a spectacular own, own goal by treating people in this way and letting the world know that you cannot be, you not, cannot claim to be the bastion of democracy, freedom, human rights, and the rule of law when you flout every single one of them at Guantanamo.
Mm. And it, I mean, I mean, in that, in those, I've heard loads of stories about you know people were sold to kind of uh, the Americans on made up kind of charges. Local disputes probably ended up with people saying, "Hey, you know, this guy hates kind of America. Take him out, away," kind of thing. There didn't seem to be any kind of process or legal recourse. It just seemed like quite slapdash, actually. I mean, from what you've heard, how how did some of these other people get there? Are, are those case is true is that what happened to a lot of people yeah so there, there are a number of different types of uh, scenarios one of the reports i think uh, by one of the uh, the commanders the commanders at guantanamo the generals said that 86 percent of those who are at guantanamo were not involved in fighting the united states of america so let's just say 86 percent were the majority were 14 percent were we're not denying that there are people in guantanamo who were who fought against the United States, as I said, so, as some of the leaders of the Taliban uh, are, are now ministers in their government, and that hasn't stopped them from being released. Uh, there were, of course, members of Al-Qaeda uh, who fought against the United States of America and believed themselves to be involved in that war. Uh, and there were people who were neither part of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, but were working um, with, alongside the Taliban as foreign fighters um, against the Northern Alliance. So there are a handful of people who did. But the overwhelming majority of people were sent over there based upon dodgy information, mm. based upon uh, bounty money, based mm. upon uh, threats. Uh, some countries literally, when I was handed over by the Pakistanis, they said to me, literally, son, you, we know you've done nothing wrong here. You're not wanted uh, for anything in this country. But we, if we don't hand you over to the Americans, and the Americans will do to us what they said, and that is bomb us back into the Stone Age. So um, uh, the the... the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, was actually, even as a diplomat, handed over. And imagine, the, the, imagine doing this. You've taken a diplomat and you go to the embassy, grab the diplomat and hand him over to the Americans. Uh, and uh, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif says, they said to me, you know, we're sorry about this. We know you've not done anything in this country, um, but we are, as in uh, Urdu, they say, majboor. So he says in his book, which I have behind me, he says, I don't call this Pakistan anymore. I call this Majburistan, that this is a place where we have no choice but to hand you over. But of course, handing somebody over is a choice. Mm -hmm. And it's a choice of, uh, uh, of doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And many countries, not just Pakistan, Azerbaijan, Zambia, Gambia, Indonesia, Jordan, Morocco, all of these countries were involved either in handing people over or um, being part of the nefarious hidden torture program, um, which found countries like Syria, countries like uh, Libya, countries that you would not expect worked alongside the United States of America actually working as part of the torture program. So um, everybody was involved, everyone. Yeah. And, and, and some of the cases we've heard of, you know, some of these people handed over, there, there were some children who were detained. I mean, what do you know, what do you know about that? Um, I was detained with children. I, I, I saw children 11, 12, 13 14, 15 years old, they were in prison with me in the cells. There was one young boy, Omar Khadr, I just did an event with him on the weekend. Um, he grew in a, into a man in, in US custody. He was first brought into custody when he was 14 years old. He'd been terribly wounded in a US bombing strike. Uh, they had, he had a massive exit wound of, of a shotgun blasted right from his back um, that just missed his heart. He was, sh uh, he had blind, he was blinded in one eye. They had operated on his chest. He looked like a walking autopsy. And uh, he was a Canadian 15-year-old kid. Uh, eventually, he, he was released um, when he was 27, 27 years old. And the Canadian government had been involved in his abuse. Uh, just a couple of years ago, in 2017, uh, Justin Trudeau apologized to him personally and paid him $10 million in compensation. But no amount of compensation mm. or apology is going to bring back those years, yeah. or more importantly, what are the laws of children at war? Even if he was a fighter, let's say he was a fighter, which he wasn't, but if he was, then how are you supposed to treat children? Uh, there's no point in, in uh, condemning African nations for what they do to children at war when America does exactly the same. Mm, no, absolutely. I mean, the numbers are, are, are shocking. You know, a recent report to mark 20 years of uh, Guantanamo undertaken by Brown University's Watson Institute and Human Rights Watch, of course, put some kind of startling figures out there. You know, like we said, nearly 800 held in Guantanamo, 39 remain, 27 of them without criminal charges, 
like you said, thousands of men and in some cases boys and women kept in detention centers, including Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, the infamous Abu Ghraib as well, and other kind of black sites. $54 million a year it costs U.S. taxpayers just to detain uh, people at Guantanamo. Apparently, U.S. spent $5.48 trillion on the war on terror. 119 Muslim men got renditioned, detained and interrogated. There was, like you say, torturing, at least according to this report, of 39 with waterboarding, whaling, rectal feeding and other forms of torture. I mean, it's shocking stuff. What was some of the things you experienced or saw? Just, just so we, I mean, you know, the, the 119 that they mentioned in that, that's the Senate report on torture that was done in 2014 by uh, Senator Diane Fenstein's office. Now, when they say 119 people, that's part of the actual rendition program where people are literally... Mm picked up off the streets and taken off to secret detention sites. This doesn't include Guantanamo, it doesn't include Bagram, which are the military detention mm -hmm. sites. And it's important that we make that we make that connection because it, it's not 119 actually, it's it's over a thousand uh, people that are taken into Guantanamo if you add them all together, mm -hmm. uh, including those who are released and so forth. Um, and then you've got the torture program and that's why that's important because the enhanced interrogation technique program, which is a it's it's this is an attempt by lawyers this is this is how this is how uh, vindictive and how insidious this is lawyers the most senior legal advisors to the bush administration tr craft law to say that essentially if it's not organ failure or death then it's not torture so pulling out fingernails slapping somebody against the wall waterboarding them using the medieval torture technique that was used against muslims during the spanish inquisition um twisting somebody's arms smacking it against the wall putting them in a coffin while they're alive, putting non-lethal insects into that coffin, uh, bringing family members or sounds of family members, uh, making made, that you're made to believe is, is, your fat, is your wife or your daughter or your children screaming in the next door. All of these things don't come un under the, the, the enhanced interrogation definition uh, uh, as torture. And the United Nations Convention Against Torture, of course, recognizes psychological torture, let alone mm. physical. Uh, so the use of all of these things music, loud music, constant music, even if it's something that's mundane, like uh, something out of Sesame Street, but constantly playing it while um, uh, you're in a stress position is all designed from the CIA techniques that they themselves uh, developed during the Korean War uh, because they wanted to see what, um, use Korean techniques against, um, or, and train their soldiers to, to break or to, uh, endure these Korean techniques. So that's where they've taken them from. And it's then developed into the program, the Sears program, uh, which was all about um, escape, about prisoners who are captured and what, this, what they're supposed to do. It's not supposed to be for uh, when you capture prisoners because if you treat them in this way, you're breaking your own rules. And uh, so they've tried to say, we're not really doing what mm -hmm. the Arab nations do. So the Arab nations will, will you know, literally rape you. They'll literally bring your family in front of you and, and uh, beat you physically with wires. and, and uh, So they won't go that far. But what they'll do is they'll send you over to the Arab nations that do that and say, mm. you know, sorry, we can't do anything. We will send you there. So this is known as the outsourcing of torture. And I say, well, I know all of this because it was either done to me or because it was, I was threatened with it. It was one or the other. Or I know people who've, who've endured it. Um, so it is a holistic program. And the, the torture program itself was developed by psychologists, military psychologists, in order to break and to tap into the sensitivities of a Muslim man. That, and that's what they'd researched. And that's why you have things like long-term nudity. Imagine being in the naked for weeks on end. How do you pray? Where's the fiqh? Mm. Which fiqh book tells you about how you pray naked? There isn't one. And it's those sensitivities. How do you pray when you can't make wudu? How do you pray when you've defecated of yourself because you've been in a coffin for three days? How do you do that? Of course you can. You still have to pray. But just to think about that for a person is uh, unbelievable. Hmm. I mean, why, why do you think, I mean, like you say, the Americans used kind of various definitions to say it wasn't torture. You know, Bush denied it. They, you know, like you say, they called it interrogation techniques. Um, but when they did admit it, they, they talked about, you know, I guess like the ticking bomb scenario. I mean, why would they, why would they, what was the benefit of doing that when, you know, studies have shown that getting confessions under duress is not 
particularly reliable and like you say it leads to people making stuff up because they're they're broken it's like a one flow over one flew over the cuckoo's nest kind of scenario that the people are broken how can you rely on that evidence so what possessed them to do it if there's no evidence to show that it works when it comes to even if they believe some people were guilty g- gaining evidence well the, the truth is they didn't know they didn't know there was no program all, all of this enhanced interrogation technique program was put in into into motion without any thought and without it was just we have to do something we've got to protect but Amer- american lives as if the lives of everybody else uh, are not important and there's a really important case that defines uh, in evidence what torture does so when i was held uh, by the cia and the american military in bagram uh, they said if you don't cooperate we will do to you what we did to somebody called ibn sheikh al libi that's a really important name his actual real name is ali al fakhri he's a is a libyan they captured him and they said that um he was held here in this room where you were and he didn't cooperate with us so we sent him to egypt and he was sent to egypt in a coffin alive uh and when he went to egypt he was tortured again egypt is famous for its techniques of tortures uh, mm-hmm. things that even the american wouldn't do there within two days he confessed and confessed to two things that were completely false one is that he was a member of al qaeda and two that al qaeda was working with saddam hussein and the iraqi regime on obtaining weapons of mass destruction mm-hmm. chemical weapons uh to kill americans this information was gra- given to colin powell, powell powell who was the secretary of state of the united states of america in 2003 and he presented this to the united nations security council as the credible information credible evidence uh and then it became the key justification for the invasion of Iraq. We know there was no al-Qaeda in Iraq before the invasion and we know there were no weapons of mass destruction. The Americans knew this, but they tortured it out of him because they needed something. Mm. They wanted to go to Iraq. They were finally what they were uh, um spoiling for a war in Iraq and they just needed that link. Ibn Sheikh al-Libi after that wasn't didn't go to Guantanamo where he might have got some kind of representation. He was sent back to Libya of all places where he was a dissident and in May 2009 he turned up in his cell dead during the arab spring i walked into that prison into the cell that had been liberated and i saw uh, where they said he killed himself and there is no place where a person can hang themselves so this was like the he didn't the confession it invaded iraq all of the, the the evidence showed that the americans had destroyed and dismembered this country isis came as a result of that mm-hmm. dismemberment more laws came against the muslim world as a result of that dismemberment of iraq but ibn sheikh al libi was no longer alive to tell the to tell because he'd been systematically killed so this is the level at which this is what torture has and this was a torture in uh, uh, interrogation that brought them to the invasion of Iraq mm, i mean like you say Guantanamo provided a catalyst some say you know it has fueled some of the angst and horrifying stuff we've seen in the in the middle east uh, i mean not just in i suppose destabilizing the whole area but also blow back in terms of you know terrorism as well i mean isis like you said use kind of guantanamo iconography and language mm. f- for their atrocities like the orange suits yeah. absolutely yeah. and and it's it's kind of violence begets violence doesn't it in that sense Yeah so I mean look there's two people there's two I think the the, the Britons at the moment um they're they've actually been extradited from Syria to uh America and one of the things that they're accused of doing is dressing up their victims who included British aid workers who'd come to help the Syrians and journalists American journalists dressing them up in orange Guantanamo style mm-hmm. jumpsuits waterboarding them so that that's the technique that was used and is infamous now for being uh, connected to prisoners in Guantanamo uh, and then executed them so uh, before that even in 2005 i remember i made a key, uh, appeal to some kidnappers in iraq who dressed their mm-hmm. victims in orange jumpsuits and and uh, went on to execute some of them some were some were freed but one of the reasons why i made the appeal was because i just come back from Guantanamo and had been in that orange jumpsuit he said please don't do this in in our name uh this we as muslims are not allowed to allow our oppressor to become our teacher and uh but there's not no doubt there's this trauma that exists within the muslim world where people have tried to justify their actions by citing Guantanamo 
do, 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 would you say it's because of that that's why you've seen this almost I don't know groups like ISIS who seem to be on you know steroids for want of a better word when it comes to kind of violence and brutality do you think it stems from this Guantanamo and the thing the West have done in terms of their standing and how they've conducted themselves well I mean that's one of the arguments they use I mean but it, it is important that we understand that the probably uh, the majority of Guantanamo prisoners that I've ever come across are opposed to in every single way um, what, what ISIS does and stands for, but certainly ISIS uses that iconography, that imagery, uh, that justification of the West has done X, Y, Z to us. And there is, a, of course, there's, there's, there's evidence to show, even the British government had said that the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan would likely increase, uh, increase, increase terrorism in this country. That's, that's not rocket science. Um, ISIS and, and some of these other organizations have a warped belief system anyway, mm. in which they kind of pronounce the fear of, of Muslims. So, you know, their, target are, their targets are more Muslims than anyone else. Uh, but had there been no Guantanamo, would people be able to argue and say, oh, look, the Americans are doing bad things to us? Yes, they could, but because the invasion still happened. But what they couldn't do is say, look, uh, the Americans mistreat their prisoners. They treat their prisoner, prisoners with dignity. And that also comes back because the prisoners are from 40 different nations and they come back and they say, the Americans did this. The Americans ripped the Quran in front of us. They've urinated on it. They, they spat on it. And I had to sit there and watch. Whereas so if the Americans had treated us with decency, then we would have gone back and told people, look, the Americans are very, very decent people, even in, in war. They're magnanimous and they should be uh, respected for that. But they didn't do that. In in your own experience, like you said, you you've seen them, you you've felt the torture yourself from uh, uh, the guards at Guantanamo. You have seen them desecrate the Quran. Yet uh, you want somebody who then adopted that mindset that ISIS or other groups do push out. Yet you are right in the middle of it. So what separates you and your experiences from from them? How how come you haven't fought, fought, felt victim to uh, the type of narrative that groups like ISIS are pushing out? Um, I think because life and experience teaches you something, uh, and also that. Everybody, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lay su sawa, everybody's not the same. Mm. And you can't look at everybody the same. My experience of American soldiers in, in Guantanamo, even in Bagram, is varied. It's not, they're not all the same. Uh, some of them took their shahada in Guantanamo. Some of them took their shahada after Guantanamo. They were male, they were female, they were black, they were white, they were Hispanic. Uh, they were East Coast, West Coast, and, and, and Midwest. All of them. They were, uh, and so to... That's one of the reasons why I don't hate the United States of America as, as a place because of very decent, there were some very decent soldiers who weren't Muslims, who were Christians or uh, atheists who bought us news, bought us little bits of information, bought us little bits of food when it was a crime to do so and they would have got thrown out and prosecuted within the military. Some of them have visited me in my home and stayed with me and have met my family and toured the world with me. So it's important that we understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya uh, ladina amanu kunu qawwameen allahi shuhada abil qist. Oh, you believe stand as just witnesses for Allah. And, and, wala yaji mannakum shana'ana qawmin ala illa ta'adilu a'adiluhu aqrabu bil taqwa. And do not allow your animosity or hatred of a people to cause you to do them an injustice. So if they are being unjust towards me and my, my, uh, my compatriots, I'm not required. In fact, Allah tells me not to do what they do. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the famous, the great famous warrior Omar al-Mukhtar who fought against uh, the, the Italian occupiers all his life and was executed by them. He said famously, they are not our teachers. So who is greater as a resistance fight? Who, who has more credibility? Somebody who fights uh, the occupier or somebody who just gets riled up about it? But then he says, they are not my teachers. And I, I, I take somebody like that as an example that my enemy, my oppressor, my torturer, my jailer is not my teacher. My teacher is rahmatillil alameen, mercy to all mankind. Did, did you, I mean, I mean, I saw that video of um, uh, one of the guards that came to live with you. This was about five, six mm. years ago. And, it, it, you know, it was quite touching to see. But um, w were there some guards that were just you know, like beyond the pale, almost kind of sociopathic and, and, and psychopathic, I suppose, as well. Uh, and then there were, uh, th did you see that dichotomy? But there were others who saw the, 
the injustice that was happening and were yes. willing to meet you in the middle, kind of reach out to you. Exactly. That, of course they were. I mean, when I described the, the, the torture program and the torture process, there have to be people who carry it out. And it's the soldiers. It's not normally, it's not the people at the top who, who, who design and justify the program. They don't carry out the program. The program. It's the ordinary grunt soldiers who have to do it. And amongst them are those with a conscience and those who don't have one. And like anything else, you know, human beings are complicated uh, mm -hmm. people, um, species. And there were in the beginning many who deeply brutalized us, brutalized us in ways that you, I can't, it's, it's hard to describe, stripped us naked, beat us, tortured us, spat upon us, uh, brought dogs to salivate upon us, ripped the Quran, urinated on it, stamped mm -hmm. on it, spat on it, everything. But what did we do? That What's important is they may have done that, but what did we do? As Allah said, Our Iman increased. Those who, who, who we said, okay, don't keep a Quran in myself. I'm not going to allow you to abuse the Quran so you want to get to me. I'm going to learn from my brother who's memorized it. He's going to teach me in the old way of the original way the Prophet ﷺ taught his companions. He couldn't read. When, when he was asked to read in the name of your Lord who created, he said, I do not read. I cannot read. But that didn't stop him teaching the Quran, did it? And that's how the companions learned. They didn't learn from a book. They learned from uh, the word of mouth. So that's how many of us learned the Quran. Uh, uh, many became hafaz of the Quran in Guantanamo as a result of that process of abuse. Uh, so alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, all of this stuff, whatever they tried to do to us from, uh, from, their own, from the darkness within some of these own soldiers, uh, it had the opposite effect it, for, for the most part. It had a physical effect, of course, there's no doubt, there's trauma that we suffer as a result of it. But the, uh, my belief and my understanding is a lot more of those soldiers suffer as a result of mm. PTSD for what they mm. did mm. than what we did than what was done to us because we weren't wronging anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's incredible to hear that going through such a huge test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it, it actually brings you closer. And we know that test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that is the purpose of them. But sometimes we, uh, in, in terms of ordinary daily life, we go through much smaller tests than going to Guantanamo Bay and being tortured. And yet those smaller tests sometimes uh, take us away from the remembrance of Allah. Sometimes it's something as small as I'm feeling a bit ill and so I cannot keep up my salah. You know, it might be something as I'm having a busy day and, and therefore I'm going to miss this salah, whatever it is, right? Uh, but for yourself, going through an incredible amount uh, and the others around you, you all still managed to increase your iman and to still have that faith. What, what, what is it? What's driving that within yourself and within uh, uh, your, you know, the fellow uh, uh, people that you had around you in Guantanamo? What was driving uh, in you in your mind, in your heart, in your soul to make you go closer to Allah rather than uh, have a rejection of Him? You know, I remember there was, a, there was a soldier once, he came to me in solitary confinement after, I think I've been there for like two years or so. Um, and when I say solitary, I mean, you have no access to any other human being other than soldiers and interrogators, like no prisoners, no family, no visits, nothing, no TV. There's no, there's no window in the cell. Like you can't even see outside. You don't even know what time of day it is. You have to guess the prayer times. So you have to guess everything in terms, you don't have a calendar or a clock. And, and, and they, did, they, they didn't help with that or facilitate any of that stuff at all. No, they were, but there were decent soldiers. There were some decent soldiers who would, against the rules, tell you the time, against mm. the rules, bring you information, against the rules, tell you what's happening in your, in your own world by doing a search on you and then printing something out and then sneaking it to you. There were decent soldiers, and I have to remember, that's why I'm saying that there were those decent soldiers, I will never forget them. But the rules were, none of that is allowed. And so one soldier said to me once, um, you know, if I was in your situation here looking at you every day, I would have gone mad by now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said to him, you know, I, I have five things to look forward to every single day. Mm -hmm. So my day gets broken up mm -hmm. by these five different things. And they're called the Salah. And this is the time at which I connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, <laughs> I'm the last to say that I have, my Iman is really high or was really high at every time. The Iman goes up and down. But what does happen is that you start to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is nowhere else to turn. Mm. And what you start telling yourself and reminding yourself is you should have done that anyway. But mm. now in this time of hardship, there is no one than Allah, than, other than Allah. And so you build a relationship with him, having a Quran for the times that we did have it when it wasn't being desecrated. Also 
um, made me look at particular stories, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, how he's in prison for a crime he doesn't commit, um, but also so many others about standing firm. And then also in the rare occasions that I did get to be with other prisoners, the beautiful verse of the Quran, مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الرِّجَالُ السَّدَقُوا مَا عَدَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ مِنُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَ وَمَيْنُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَذِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا Amongst the believers are those who stay true to their covenant with Allah. Amongst them are those who have passed away and there are some who are still waiting and they didn't change one iota. They remain true to their covenant. And things like that, when you read them in the context of prison, it brings you, um, it, it really brings you into a different place. And it was this type of faith and connection to the faith that saw American soldiers, including females, in fact, some several females, who looked at us and said, Ya Allah, like my God, mm -hmm. if this is the faith that protects you and builds you as a person and gives you tranquility in a place like this, I want to be a part of it. And some of them took the shahada. Subhanallah. And you hear from the seerah that there are moments where you know, there are companions, is the Prophet Sallallahu they're reciting Qur'an in the night, and you find that there are the leaders of Quraysh, or those who are committing torture or oppression to the Muslims, they're very intrigued, and they're coming to listen to the Qur'an. We have people like Abu Jahl who are, who are saying, this is an amazing thing that I've heard, and then there's other people around him who are coming, and they're saying, I've also heard this, but let us not go back to our people and say that it was an amazing thing that we heard, and they're referring to the Qur'an. Uh, so you have these stories of oppressors being drawn towards the Qur'an uh, from, th from the recitation of those who are being oppressed. Did you find a similar situation happen in Guantanamo Bay? Were there guards who were there who were listening to the Qur'an or who were looking at the actions of the Muslims that were there, the fact that they have so much strength and they were taking inspiration from that? Yeah, two little things, two things come to mind. Of course, yes. Um, most people don't understand the Quran uh, from, from the guards, so it, but it's just the sound. Um, but there was one I remember, it was in the Kandahar prison, and it later happened in Guantanamo, that whenever one of us called the Adhan, uh, everything would just go stop, it would just go calm. Even the American soldiers, they, for whatever reason, they just slow down, they would stop doing what they were doing. And um, one of these soldiers used to come and listen, stand and said, listen, and, and listen. And he would say, and I remember when he said this, he said, you know, I don't know what this song is, but it's the most beautiful song I've ever heard. And uh, then, and I've experienced this before. And I said, well, let me tell you what this song actually means. And there was another occasion. I mean, when uh, in Guantanamo, it happens still every, to this day, it still happens. Uh, precisely at um, Maghrib time, of course, we call the Adhan for Maghrib. There are different blocks where different uh, brothers are calling Adhan because you can't hear Right. Uh, enough on, on each block. Uh, but precisely at this time, and this isn't by design, this is American military bases do this around the world. And that is, they play the national anthem and they play it on huge loudspeakers around the island. So what you've got is a battle for the airwaves uh, between the Adhan and the US yeah. national anthem. And the US soldier is required at that point, whatever they're doing, uh, anything that they're doing, is supposed to stop what they're doing, mm. face the huge flag in the middle of Guantanamo, and salute the flag. They do that at schools as well, don't they? I mean, yeah. it's quite patriotic yeah. like that over there. But see, the thing now, the contrast is yeah. at that time, and I remember there was an Australian prisoner, he said, they said, look, one group that dressed, dressed in military gear, they're saluting the object of their devotion. And the other group dressed in orange, they're saluting the object of their devotion. Mm. And uh, you ask yourself, which is of the two are deeply sincere? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is doing it because out of the heart and which is doing it out of, protocol yeah and uh, i came across so many soldiers saying i ain't doing that that's a waste of time also, i'm carrying on doing my work <laughs> no prisoner's going to say i that's a waste of time i'm not going to pray mm. no one's going to do that yeah. so you see the difference yeah no I, 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 and absolutely but there, also i guess there must have been situations because you know people are consequences because they've been broken down that they i've out. lost your sound sorry sorry, sorry. Can, can you hear right. me now yeah, yes. Sorry, it's 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 the mic <laughs> operating. I'm I'm failing on that. I'm, I think, um, yeah, I'm I'm saying in terms of um, there must have been other people there who weren't kind of compass mentors who were psychologically broken down who may have kind of wavered on their faith. You know, there was like alleged course, suicides, yeah, course, yeah. Uh, although we don't know whether there was some sort of state involvement in those. 
I mean, did you see that? That must have been quite tough as well for some people. Yeah, I mean, of course, we, you know, we're talking about close to 800 prisoners and everybody's not going to be the same and everybody's not going to have... Experiences go up and down. Even for me, I, there were times when I lost my mind, when I lost my mm. uh, ability to think properly, being in a, con a solitary confinement for a, quite some time. Um, but it did happen. It did happen. It, it did happen. Some people did lose their minds. Some people have lost their minds. Some people have released and lost their minds afterwards. Some had lost, some lost their lives. There were nine prisoners who died in Guantanamo. Um, so there is all of that. Of course, there's no doubt. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about uh, people suffering in different ways. Some people, um, some people stopped practicing the deen. One or two people I know who stopped practicing the deen, but that's because they had, they were not originally Muslims to begin with. And had no support system from back home. If they're mm. going to go back home, they're going to go back to an entirely non-Muslim support system. Uh, it did happen, in, but these are these are smaller cases, handful of cases. It's important we, we point them out. Um, but overwhelmingly, my experience has been over the past 15 years since my release of uh, doing countless interviews and meeting with former prisoners around the world is that you will see a level of iman, faith, passion, compassion, care, love, uh, hope and mercy that you won't find in ordinary people bearing in mind what these guys have gone through. Mm. Just uh, bringing it back to, this is, you know, 20 years since Guantanamo Bay. Uh, where are these people now? Uh, where are some of these guards? Where are uh, some of these uh, uh, former uh, detainees that were with you? Um, where are they in the world and, and how are they doing? Well, you know, if you were to add them all together, guards, detainees, and whatever, you'd, you'd be talking well over a thousand people. And uh, as I said, I've traveled to, to different parts of the world, met several, several of them, Sudan, some are in Malaysia, some are in uh, Chad, some are, there are Uyghurs, there were 22 Uyghurs uh, from East Turkestan who were helped one time ago. And they were sent to places like Bermuda, resettled rather, to places like Bermuda, El Salvador, Palau, Albania, Switzerland. Uh, there are former prisoners who, who resettled uh, Libyans to Senegal and to Georgia, Yemenis to Kazakhstan. I mean, the, the list is endless. There's a massive number of prisoners who were resettled around the world because of the irony was this, is that if they go back to their home countries, their home countries were places like at the time Libya or Egypt or Syria, then they would go back on to face almost imminent torture and possible execution because America had held them as terrorism suspe suspects. Forget the fact that they were innocent held without charge or trial if they were to go back to these countries they'd say ah oh, america did help you but they must have held you for some good ring you're a terrorism suspect you're going to so america <laughs> trying not to break their obligations for the person not to be tortured which is the greatest irony found them homes uh, in places where they wouldn't be tortured uh, but they face a lot of other difficulties i've visited many of them uh, and so many of them majority of them can't travel uh, they don't know the languages in the countries where they're at they have no family members there there's in some places there are six, uh, there were six, for example, Tunisians and Syrians sent to Uruguay in Montevideo, the day in the mm -hmm. capital, there's not even one masjid. So there's all of these terrible problems they face, uh, but it's not as bad, I guess, as, as uh, being in prison. But some have described it as Guantanamo 2.0, mm -hmm. as in you are in another type of prison yeah. where you can't live a normal, meaningful life. Mm -hmm. I mean, who do you ultimately hold responsible for Guantanamo, for your treatment, for tarnishing the lives of, as you've pointed out, so many innocent people. Um, you know, is it is it is it American? Is it Bush? Is it Blair? Ultimately, whose door should this be on? Um, there's general and there's specific. Uh, generally, the United States of America, obviously, they they did what they did. Uh, none of us, majority, have never been to America. I've never been to America. Never been west of Ireland. Um, but America came to us. So America took us by force. Uh, who had their hands involved in that? Uh, the weaker countries maybe who were pressed into it, like Pakistan, Morocco, and all the others I've mentioned. Uh, but then there were countries that were powerful and were passing false information over to the Americans. And those are countries like Britain and Canada um, who, knew, who ought to have known better. Uh, they took part. They took part in the integration. In my case, they were there physically before, during, and after the interrogations. They were there when people were being murdered in Bagram. 
by American soldiers. They were there when people, when me and other British citizens were being tortured there. Um, so they had a big, huge hand. And that's why uh, uh, we did litigation against the government, against MI5. Uh, we won a, a, an out of court settlement, but they still, as they always do, and this is one of the most important things here, I've been involved in so many processes from giving evidence to the International Criminal Court, to a war crimes tribunal, to giving evidence to the British police, Metropolitan Police, about the role of MI5 agents in torture, uh, to giving evidence at an independent judge-led inquiry ordered by David Cameron into the role of British intelligence service in torture. And I can tell you every single time the government has got away. Mm. Uh, they, even with the police, uh, the police said that they are they refuse to cooperate with us. Imagine that. Imagine you committed a crime. You said, I refuse to cooperate with the police. Do, do you think they give up the investigation? That's what happened with the police. And that's what's happened across the world. So it tells you literally... In my experience of 15 years of this, they are above the law. All of the governments and their, uh, their leaderships that's been involved in this are above the law. And not that I really want to play the devil's advocate, I guess the US would say, you know, it's exceptional cir circumstances, it was necessary, they, they didn't know what to do with those captured. Um, like I said, it was exceptional circumstances. What would you say to that, that regardless of all those things you need to abide by the rule of law and and fundamentally they they didn't do that and, and and even still now although obama promised biden has promised that it's gonna shut down there's still those arguments mm. happening that well this might be a necessary facility for the same reasons that still yeah. exist today well you know the saying says necessity knows no bounds and the truth of this is that whatever happened wasn't worse than world war ii right and all of these laws all of these conventions all of these treaties all of these Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they all came as a result of World War II, in which 60 million people were killed. The numbers of prisoners simply were so many, nobody even bothers to count. The, the, the cases of torture are so many around the world at that time that nobody even bothers including that in the statistics anymore. But they came out of a situation that was much worse than what's happening now. And they came for that reason. And they didn't come out. It wasn't Islamic nations that brought these out. It was the Western nations. They, they fought two world wars to get these laws in the mm -hmm. first place. They had to kill each other at the rate of 80, 90 million to get to this. Now you're coming along to the Muslim world and saying, we have to put these aside because um, we've got a little war going on. No, it's not going to buy. You either follow your rules or, or, or declare to the world that you are utter hypocrites. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I guess eventually, you know, you were released, alhamdulillah. Uh, how, how did that feel? Just that, I suppose we can't comprehend, you know, at all. I mean, did you feel like I just need to catch up and process everything hap that's happened? Or were you like, do you know what? Uh, let's go on a, you know, mission to sort this out get involved in the political side of things. I mean, what was your kind of thought process like when you were released on that day? Yeah. Um, well, no, the thought process was very much about my family. I, I had to come mm. back at home to see four children, including a younger child, youngest child I'd never seen before. Um, so, of course, my thoughts were around that. Um, although you have to tell yourself as a prisoner that you are not a father, you're not a son, you're not a husband, you're just a, a number because if you think beyond that, um, you, you might just lose your mind thinking about your family because that's yeah. the so, so how did that feel, that emotional connection? I guess you had to turn that back on again. Was that difficult? Yeah, you have to, you have to you've got to, exactly, you've got to turn it back on. So, but because mine had been turned, I mean, in the early days, it's very, very painful, a lot of grief, a lot of tears, etc. cetera. Um, that's when I was early days of, as a prisoner. Yeah. Uh, by the time I get out, I got out, that had, I turned that off. So I wasn't deeply emotional the way that a person may have expected to, though they were. Um, but I think the first thing in my mind, other than that, was to, you know, what does a person do when they get released? I asked my wife, I said, uh, 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 can I just take your car, please, for a spin? <laughs> now, I had no insurance. I had, pretty sure, I don't know where my license was. sure you want to admit that? <laughs> yeah, who cares? What are they going to do, put me in Guantanamo? <laughs> um, and I got into a car and I drove as fast as I could. I probably even broke the speed limit. I don't know. Um <laughs> And I wound down the windows and I felt that wind in my face mm. and in my hair yeah. and that sense of freedom. Mm. And uh, I, I, it's very hard to describe what that feels like uh, when you haven't tasted for, for so many years. Mm. Mm. Uh, and then after that, yes, I did. 
Of course, I joined the organization CAGE, yeah. uh, and that's because CAGE had the most comprehensive listing of the prisoners held in Guantanamo. Mm. And many of the prisoners I didn't even know or had seen by face, but had no idea who they were, what their backstories were. So I started get involved in getting involved in the campaign to close Guantanamo. And then, of course, everything else, there's a Guantanamoization of the laws and the legislations, the introduction of anti-terror laws here in the UK, which targeted Muslims and continues to do so. So there's that, been that kind of broad connection, but it all started in Guantanamo. Right. Your your late father kind of tirelessly campaigned for your release. Uh, I remember him vividly, you know, at kind of park rally events uh, where, where he spoke. You know, he shared, uh, I seem to remember, a stage with, you know, Terry Waite, who was like a well-known uh, person held captive, I think, in the early 80s in Lebanon, I believe. Thanks for letting you me know. know. Oh, uh, my young age, I don't yeah, know how many yeah, 80s. Well, 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 <laughs> that's what I thought. And, you know, like he was shared a stage with actress Vanessa Redgrave, I believe. You must have been really proud and felt blessed for what your dad family did. You know, parents are a real blessing in Islam and it showed, didn't it? Yeah, alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, you know, really to see. But my father was, my father had become a, you know, public figure by the time I came back. He had like two phones on the go when I was, <laughs> he was uh, fending off interviews with the Times and the Sun saying, come back another day. What This is this is the day I came back. And I, I'd seen, subhanAllah, he'd become such a figure, such a such a role model, such a, uh, a vision of strength. And as you say, all of these individuals, uh, Vanessa Redgrave, I got to know him, got, got to know her rather because of my father. Uh, Terry Waite, I've got to know him very well over the years. Again, because of my father and many other people, he'd gone up and down the country, mm. he'd, gone to, he'd gone to the White House and he literally offered Bush out and said, listen, come out here and uh, either you tell me what are the charges against my son or you release him. And he'd done it in such a dignified manner uh, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have, have mercy upon him and, and forgive him and uh, uh, enter him into gender. Amen. He, he really, and to this day, when people like you say, still remember him, it's a, it's a testament to his strength and his... Uh, determination for a, a principle and there was a simple principle I remember he used to say and I've seen those videos that if my do son's done something then put him uh, 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 put him into prison punish him but if he hasn't he's not the criminal mm. you are mm. um, and that was such a profound thing for him to say absolutely uh, yeah and again we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expand his grave and grants him genital yeah. firdos and we are re reunited with him and uh, you know you remember him but I, I wasn't you know I was I was small at that time and uh, I, I hope that I can speak to him and ask him about all these things that he did inshallah um, yeah. you've been you've been working uh, as you mentioned with cage for quite a while now and uh, they've had a campaign uh, going on for many many years in order to make sure that Guantanamo Bay closes down and I guess this you know the title of this podcast being the 20th anniversary reminds us that there's still work to do there's still work to be done uh, so what are the next steps that yourself cage uh, and any other groups that are working towards closing this down what are the next steps that they're taking okay so alhamdulillah that's a really good question so for the past uh, several months since actually since the anniversary of 9-11 which was the, the 20th anniversary we've had something that's called the international witness campaign it's a uh, a grouping of over 40 different organizations from across the world, uh, America, Asia, and elsewhere, uh, where organizations, individuals, campaigners, activists, former soldiers, former uh, um, prisoners, lawyers, have come together to highlight and show through, uh, through sort of uh, book festivals, film festivals, um, events. We just had one on the weekend uh, where seven former Guantanamo prisoners got together and I hosted a discussion between them and it was a really fascinating one. Uh, so we're doing, we're doing all of this um, to make sure that, the, that Guantanamo is remembered, that the campaign for it continues and that accountability is, uh, is, is one of the things that we seek. But also there is a, an eight point plan that myself and six other former Guantanamo prisoners who were all published authors, um, we presented that plan in an open letter that was published in the New York Review of Books uh, last year. And we're asking as many prominent people as possible to sign up to this and endorse this eight point plan because what it does, it gives Joe Biden a practical 8.8 .8 step plan on how he can close Guantanamo easily and still save face. So um, please, if you can and, and are able to go to uh, cage.ngo uh, and look for the eight-point plan, uh, go to our social media, again, Cage, 
uh, or on uh, um, Instagram with Cage uh, and try to endorse this plan. Get people that you know that are influential um, to sign this, uh, to endorse this eight-point plan. Okay. And just to kind of wrap up here, uh, unless you have anything else to add after this, um, how do you, Muslim, still have the patience to continue this fight? It's been going on for so long and you're still here, you're still doing these interviews, doing these podcasts, still going to speak at events. Where's the patience coming from? How, how are you continuing to do this? Um, well, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I guess because of as long as there's still one prisoner left there, um, as long as there's somebody still asking for help, and we have many people asking for help, uh, then the obligation remains. We would never, never have imagined even 20 years ago that Guantanamo would still be open, even though the Americans said there are people who will be here for the rest of their lives. Uh, but it's okay. If you did something, then fair enough, you pay the price. But if you did nothing and the, the, the crime was done against you, then as long as we're alive, as long as I am alive, I will fight to ensure that justice is done in this dunya, if not in the akhirah, and that those who are oppressed have a voice in us. Jazakal khair, Madam. Really inspirational. Great to speak to you. Uh, and Jamil. Uh, thank you for Jazakal khair and thanks, Jamil, for coming on and being my co host. Alhamdulillah, you did a great job. You oh. took over the mic most of the time. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, so, to our viewers, thank you for joining us. Uh, and if you want to get more of these episodes uh, and you want to hear from more and more guests, then please do make sure that you follow, you subscribe, and you come back to this Islam Channel podcast to hear from more Muslim thinkers and Muslim leaders about current topics, about classical Islamic teachings. And remember, you can find us on all the other po podcast platforms out there. Jazakallah khair and see you in the next one. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.